Hello. So this is going to be introduction to blankets. Um, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of context to understand what's going on, in particular for those of you who don't come from any kind of religious background. But first, uh, basic information. Craig Thompson was born in 75, just a few years after I was born, actually. Grew up in Michigan and Wisconsin. Blankets was uh, his big hit. It was published in 2003. And yes, as you probably figured out, since the main character is named Craig, it is autobiographical. That doesn't mean every single thing was absolutely factual. But it does seem to mean that a lot of it was, it was at least loosely based on his life. Um, I actually read his book Habibi first, which is absolutely amazing. I, I think it's a much better book than Blankets. Uh, but it is very, very graphic. You don't want to watch. You want to read Habibi if you're not prepared for lots of graphic scenes. Um, it's a pretty amazing book, though. So what I want to talk about though is religion, in particular, um, the particular religion that Craig's family follows, which is um, they're they're a member of what was it, Trinity Baptist Church? I may have that wrong, but they're definitely Baptist. Um, <sighs> used to be, uh, for a very long time, there's something called the Catholic Church. Some of you know this. Uh, and then in the 16th century, the Catholic Church kind of fell apart because we have something called the Protestant Reformation. And a whole bunch of denominations or splinter groups fell apart. And new groups like the Lutherans, the Calvinists, um, the Baptists, uh, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, after the Catholic Church kind of its strong its, its control or its presence in Europe kind of shattered, a whole bunch of smaller Christian groups um, were created, including eventually the Baptists. And the thing to keep in mind here is there's not just one kind of Christianity, just like there's not one kind of paganism, there's not one kind of uh, Islam. Uh, you've seen one Christian, that doesn't mean anything, because there are liberal Christians and there are conservative Christians. There are Christians that are atheists, that go to church, which boggles the mind, I know, but I know one. Um, so what you're reading about Christianity in this book is not necessarily a good picture of all Christians. Keep that in mind. That's important. I don't want to stereotype any group. But what I want to do is try to get you to try to help you understand um, the conflict at the center of this. So look, we're going to look at these pages, all these numbers of pages in the book. And, of course, the book is... Uh, paginated. You have to look bottom of the page. You can see um, pages, page page numbers on the bottom left and right. So if you look on page 13, and you could pause this uh, at any point to catch up. There's this picture of um, Phil and Craig. Phil is the brother, and Craig have been in bed, and they've been too loud. And the father comes in, and he is enormous, and he yells, don't question your parents' authority. He's really frightening in that picture, and he's frightening because you guys know, because he's drawn huge, and the children are drawn small. It's a very frightening image. And what happens is one of them, which one is it? I don't remember, gets put in the cubby hole. The cubby hole is like this closet that is behind the removable wood paneling in the playroom. This is on page 15. It's scary. I would never, I mean, this is, I would never take my child, however poorly he behaved, and shut him in uh, a room that is not a room. Very scary. Where is this coming from? Look on page 61. So we're trying to understand where this, I don't know if I want to call it violence, but it's pretty out there. We want to understand where this, punishment comes from? Why? What's the logic behind it? Why does it exist? On page 61, uh, we have, I think this is a Sunday school teacher talking, and she says, but if you don't ask Jesus in your heart, you'll spend eternity in hell. So there's heaven with God, right, and with the angels, and then there's hell, this place with Satan and demons. If you've seen Constantine, you know precisely what I'm talking about. Um, Hell is this place where if you're disobedient, you go. Hell is the opposite of heaven. It's the worst. I'm on page 61. 
it's the worst place you ever imagined where you on fire being burned and in constant pain. Clearly hell is an image of punishment, right? A pain that hurts so much that the Bible says you will never stop screaming or grinding your teeth. I don't know that the Bible says that anywhere, by the way. It's completely dark and all around you are the sounds of other people screaming and moaning. Okay, this is, uh, this is a picture of Christianity um, that's kind of scary. I mean, what's happening here is the fire and brimstone speech. Basically, it operates like this. People get scared to become believers. And clearly, Craig was scared. Uh, this woman is saying, you're going to spend, if you don't accept, if you don't follow God, if you don't accept Jesus in you, you will go to hell and you will burn alive forever, right? So in this version of Christianity, hell is a real place. And if you go there, you're being punished for not obeying God. Uh, a liberal Christian, some Christians don't even believe hell, believe hell exists. They believe it's a metaphor. Hell is not a place that has fire. Hell is... Instead, this experience of being alienated or separated from God and humans, it's about being alone and isolated. So keep in mind, again, Christianity is a complex thing. What you're getting here, at least in terms of his parents, is a very negative portrayal. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that his particular experience is a very one-sided experience. So there's a lot of punishment in this particular area of religion. Um, Let's turn to page 87. On 87, look what he says. Um, Craig sits down and he's praying. I'm sorry, God, for sneaking out of the cabin and lying and not reading the Bible and not witnessing to people and picking on my little brother and calling someone an ass and drawing a lady without any clothes on that one time and disappointing my parents and everything else. So he's feeling guilt-ridden. What is he feeling guilt-ridden about, right? He's lying, he says. He's not reading the Bible. He's not witnessing. Witnessing means going out and meeting people and telling them about God. Uh, he's feeling guilty about picking on his brother, calling someone an ass, and then drawing a lady without clothes on. Now, I really want to talk about this a bit. Because if you hadn't noticed, this is a romance. This is a story about desire. And yes, there's sex in this, right? He's feeling guilt-ridden that he drew a woman without any clothes on. Now, remember, the last page we looked at was page 61, in which the Sunday school teacher was basically saying to him, uh, you need to obey God, you need to accept Jesus, or you end up in hell, right? And what we hear is this, we hear this poor child sounding victimized. He's scared to death of hell, I think. He's scared to death of not behaving appropriately. Um, and, and I'm telling you all this because this will help those of you who have no religious background at all to understand why he and his girlfriend, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Raina, it'll help you understand why they have issues related to sex, okay? Um, let's keep going. Um, what I hope you've gotten so far is a picture of why they feel guilty, why they, 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 they worry about punishment. Um, go to page 27, and we're going to go all the way back quite a bit. This is a tiny little moment, no, but it speaks to uh, the issue I really want to focus on, which is bodies. Um, his teacher there gives... Craig, an F for filth, not for funny, being funny, but for filth. Why? Apparently, Craig has written something about an eight-page poem about people eating excrement, which is to say shit, right? So he's written a poem about the, <laughs> the most basic part of the body, arguably, right? Shit. The basic part of the material world. He's being criticized for writing. I mean, you know, this is not something I want to read either, granted, but he's being he's writing about bodies and he's being slapped across the face, figuratively speaking, for doing this, right? Go to page 49 to 53. This is going to take a little while. I'm going to read through these pages. There's a long, long speech here. Here's the Sunday school teacher again. Um She's saying things like, this life we live in is not always fair. 
people you care about get sick and can be hurt. What she's saying, this is very important, she's saying that death happens, people die, bodies, this is really important, bodies are temporary, temporary. Like Douglas, who broke his bone, his collarbone. So she's trying, to, the emphasis here is you can't trust the body. Bodies are temporary. They get sick, they die. On page 49, our bodies are temporary. That means they can get hurt, like Douglas's collarbone, and they can die. We are all going to die. It's scary, isn't it? All right, here's the scariness. Here's the punishment stuff, right? She's scaring some of these kids. And she's trying to suggest at the same time that because our bodies are temporary, we need not, this is my interpretation, because our bodies are temporary, we need to be thinking about something that's not temporary. The kids say, yeah, and yes, still on 49. But it doesn't have to be scary if you're a Christian and have asked Jesus into your heart, because when you die, you'll go to heaven. So the bodies are going to die. The bodies are relevant. Again, kind of reading between the lines here. The bodies are relevant because eventually you're going to have a spiritual body, and a spiritual body does not die. Heaven is a perfect world where there's no pain and everyone gets along. Heaven is where God wants us to be, and it lasts forever. Bodies are temporary. Bodies die. But heaven is forever. Now, notice what happens here. If you emphasize heaven and you emphasize the spiritual, constantly, 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 what are you de-emphasizing? What are you saying is less important? You, what you're saying is less important is the here and now, being here in the world. You know, flesh and blood is irrelevant because we're only going to be flesh and blood for a little bit of time. And then we're going to be spirits. And we're going to be spirits. We're going to be godlike. We're going to be with God forever. So why care about this earth we live on now? Why fall in love? Why engage in kissing and hugging and sex? Why do you engage in those things? Because they're temporary. They don't matter. They don't hold up to the test of time. Hopefully this is clear to you. So page 50. If this is our life on earth, then this is our life in heaven. Oops. Ha, ha, ha. People laugh. And that chalk line would keep on going even outside the state of Wisconsin and never stop. Compared to eternity, our lives on earth are only a tiny dream we fall into and then wake up from right away. She's saying that our lives on earth, the world, the concrete bodily world we exist in is irrelevant because it's a tiny part of our lives. Our real life is in heaven. You see how bodies are irrelevant here. 51, at that moment, I knew what I wanted. I wanted heaven. The kid, the, the boy Craig, totally buys into this. He wants to be up in the clouds. He wants to be with God. He doesn't want things of the earth. Turn the page, 52. And I grew up striving for that world, an eternal world, to wash away the temporary misery. So the temporary misery, right? Part of the reason he's thinking about heaven all the time, part of the reason he gives up on life and living and bodies is that, of course, Look at the way he's being treated on page 53. Kid, these kids call him a faggot. Uh, they say he looks like a fucking girl. Uh, and he says, he's thinking, this world is not my home. I'm only passing through, right? Heaven is an escape from the real world for this kid. He's thinking about heaven. He's thinking about the afterlife because it's easier to focus on that rather than actually dealing with his issues in his life. Now he's got a teacher here telling him things like, uh, I know, Mr. Thompson, you'd like to excel in this class if you only applied one iota of effort. Seems to me you can't take your studies seriously, etc., etc. And what is he thinking? For what matters if I gain the whole world but lose my soul? What, is he, what does that mean? In this context, with the teacher saying to him, hey, you're not doing any work. You're not doing any work and you're not improving. You're not... What he's saying, when Craig Thompson's character is thinking these thoughts, what he's really saying is, this is a biblical reference. What he's saying is, for what matters if I gain the whole world? Gaining the whole world would be being successful. It would be being Donald Trump. It would be getting a degree in school, getting all A's. And what Thompson is thinking, hey, gaining the whole world is pointless. What I want is my soul. The soul is not, the soul is part of heaven. The soul is part of the divine. This thing this guy is harassing me about is irrelevant. Success in the real world is irrelevant because when I die, I want to be with God, and God doesn't care if I've got money. God doesn't care if I'm a presidential candidate. 
God only cares about whether or not I've obeyed him. So, page 78. This is a beginning point. Hopefully it helps you. Um, page 78. Actually, I think I wrote that down wrong. Let's see. Um, it might have been 87. Give me a second here. No, that's all right. On 79, I'm going to end here. At secular school, I perceived myself as victim to the world's cruelty. I suspected that God would reward me one day for enduring the daily hardships. There's the word reward. I'm going to read it again. Craig says, I perceive myself as a victim at a secular school. A secular school is a school that's not Christian. Doesn't have that is not run by Christians. I suspected that God would reward me one day for enduring the daily hardships. What he's saying at that point is um, something like this: people are picking on him. Pick people are cursing him. People are calling him faggot. They're 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 attacking him. Like this is the kind of thing that happens in high school. If you're different, a tiny bit different, right? He's suggesting that all of that personal attack, all of that attack on his body, remember he's called a faggot, remember he's said, they say that he looks like a girl, all of that attack of his, on his body, he says that he can endure that because God will reward him. Now, what I'm trying to get you to think about is a kind of, what I'm trying to get you to think about is how the Christianity in this comic book really is otherworldly. They're not thinking about now. What matters is the future, and that means that bodies are irrelevant. What you endure or put up with is irrelevant today. What matters is where you're headed afterwards. So the last thing that need, the last thing that Craig should be doing is living for the body. One day I will learn to type. Last thing Craig Thompson as a child needs to be doing is thinking about sex or love. These things are of the body. They're supposed to be temporary. They're not important. Christianity is about heaven and those things that last forever. Sex, love, bodies, they're irrelevant. So that's part of the tension at the center of this book. This is a young man who really believes in his Christianity and then falls in love. And yes, the sex is part of this. And he feels guilt ridden about that because things of the body are temporary. Things of God are permanent. And it's like a battle between his body and the divine, his body and this idea he has of God. Now, this is also very complicated. Um, a liberal Christian would say something like the following. If God didn't like bodies, why did God create bodies? If God didn't like bodies, why did God come? Now, again, you're going to, I don't know how much Christianity you know, but Christians believe that God came down and put himself in human form. Um, Jesus, Jesus Christ, is the human form of God. If God doesn't like bodies, why did God come down and put himself in the human body, which is Jesus Christ, right? Now, on the other hand, a more conservative reading would point out that uh, Jesus was not born of sex. If you read the Bible, Jesus appears to have been born of the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus was not born of a man and a woman having sex. That seems to imply a kind of attack on sex and an attack on human bodies, right? The other major thing that seems to be an attack on bodies in the scripture is that, remember, at the center of Christianity is the crucifixion. Jesus dies on a cross. It is the most important event in the, in, 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 in the Bible. Uh, he dies on the cross, and he sacrifices his body. Well, his sacrifice of his body 
frees, and it's really complicated, I'm not sure I want to explain it all, but his self-sacrifice is what frees other people of their sins and allows them a passageway to God. So, point being, sacrifice of the body appears to be absolutely linked with becoming spirit or becoming finding finding God in heaven. So if Craig Thompson believes this, that he's enduring, he's sacrificing himself, he's enduring things, he's not having sex, he's not masturbating. He, he says at one point that he doesn't masturbate but once his entire, uh, when he's 18, but once, right? It's a sacrifice because sacrifice in this world is linked with divinity. If I can give up the things of the body, I'm closer to God. But again, this is just one point of view. There are liberal Christians who read the Bible in a very different way. There are scriptures in the Bible uh, that are incredibly romantic and incredibly sensual, which imply that there's lots and lots of fleshly desire in the Bible. All right. Hopefully you followed some of this and you can understand a little bit better how Craig's character is internally conflicted, right? Torn in two different directions. There's desire and sex, which is very much a thing of our lives. And then there's desire for God. And at least in this context, those things seem to be intention. Um, there are other religions that are not intention with these things. The other religions that are built around bodies entirely and don't see a conflict between God and bodies at all. All right. So hopefully it helps you. Uh, please email or uh, phone me if you have any questions. Have a good weekend.